So uh, there was one day years ago, I was turning in a paper for class. You ever had to write a paper for a class, right? Are they great or terrible? Terrible, right? Yeah, they're horrible. So I'm having to write a paper for class. And this is a very important paper. It's the most important one of the entire semester. And so I've been working on it for a long time. How many of you write papers for a long time? How many of you write papers the night before? <laughs> Some of those hands are the same. <laughs> so I I was actually, this is one of the, I've written papers the night before, but this is this is one of those where I had actually, I was really working hard for months trying to make sure this paper was good. And I was I was proud of this paper and I turned this paper in and I got like a 93. And I was like, A, that's pretty good with me. An A is an A. So I was, I was not at all upset about seven missed points somewhere. Who cares? 93 was great. Um, and I had a classmate who was turning in the exact same paper, but they had spent maybe a week or two on it. I had gotten to read that classmate's paper, and I thought, this is a piece of trash. You know what I mean? And it was sloppy, and it didn't have half the stuff that was on the rubric. And that person turned it in, and they were all excited when they come out and they get their grade. 93. I was like, no, 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 no. I thought, how on earth? Our papers were nothing alike. How on earth did you get the same grade as me? And so I felt like that was just so unfair. Do you think that was unfair? right? Some of you were like, get over it, Nathan. It was years ago. I have gotten over it. The truth is life is not always fair. And sometimes it seems to us like people who don't deserve something get something good. You ever been upset because something good came to somebody? Kind of a weird thing. You don't usually want to admit it, right? It it, it kind of makes you sad if somebody good, something bad happens to them. You're like, oh, I hate that. But when something bad happens to somebody who you hate, said, always inflict feelings of guilt or horror. You're just kind of like, oh, darn. You know what I mean? So sometimes we feel that way about each other. And certainly we feel that that way about life being fair. Well, tonight we're looking at a passage where uh, we really see that the writer of this particular psalm, we're going to be in Psalm 73, and he really feels exactly this, but to a much, much worse extent. Right? He begins to ask some deep, important questions about right and wrong and what's fair. All right, so we're going to look at Psalm 73 tonight. So you can go ahead and begin to turn there in your Bibles. We'll have it on the screen. I want to remind you, we're still in our series titled Kingdom of Choices, although we are quickly approaching the end of it. And so tonight we're looking at, at remember that Kingdom of Choices, the theme has to do with looking at choices that people in Scripture made and then trying to understand them so we can make good choices as well. He's going to ask, this, this writer is going to ask some good questions that kind of lays a choice before us. We really have to kind of choose whether or not uh, we want to feel this way about whether or not life is fair, right? So he asked some good questions. Um, but it's written by a guy named Asaph, who's clearly struggling with good versus evil. Let's ask this question, who is Asaph? All right, so Asaph is a uh, musician who wrote several of the Psalms, about a dozen of them. He was appointed in at least First Chronicles 6 by King David. Remember King David? We talked about him a lot last week. King David, the second king over Israel, kind of brings in a golden age of Israel uh, rulership for for just a hot minute, and then everything goes wrong. That's kind of what happens. Um, so he brings in a bunch of musicians, says, you guys are in charge of leading and writing music and leading us in worship, and Asaph is one of these guys. So in other words, in the ancient Israelite era of King David's leadership, Asaph's a worship pastor. Does that make sense? It's basically what he is. He's effectively... Um, an ancient, ancient Israelite version of Matthew back there. So, although I'd, I've never heard Matthew talk about this. Matthew's never been quite this mopey, I promise. Um, but this guy gets pretty mopey. So we're going to read it. Let's start with Psalm 73, just the first two verses. Then we'll just kind of walk through it together tonight. So if you're there, say, got it. Wow, it's a word. <laughs> Someone just said a word. All right, that's fine. Hope you're there. Psalm 73, it's a Psalm of Asaph. Starts like this. God is indeed good to Israel, to the pure in heart. But as for me, my feet almost slipped. My steps nearly went astray. Well, that's quite the start. So right here, right off the bat, he says his feet nearly slipped. Now, I want to remind you, when we're talking in Scripture about walking a path, that's usually talking about our lifestyles, right? How we live our life is often used, a uh, metaphor is used in scripture as in walking a path, all right? So walking a straight and narrow path, that's walking the righteous path, all right? You ever heard that before, that that narrow straight way, that's the right way? But to leave that path, right, to slip off of it, to wander off path, that's to wander into wickedness, right? That's, that's to do life my own way, not the way 
laid out for me. Does that make sense? So he's saying right off the bat, hey, God is good to us, to those of us who stay on the path, but I nearly got off the path. I nearly slipped. He says, God is good, but there was a time where I wasn't sure if I believed that. Right off the bat, he tells us where he's at. He says, God is good, but I wasn't always so sure about it. So he asked this question immediately, have you ever struggled to believe that God is good? Have you ever struggled that? It's a common question about good and evil. Is God good? He says, he is, but it was hard for me to accept that. Let's keep reading. Verse three, why is it hard for him to believe this? He says, for I envied the arrogance. I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have an easy time all the way up until they die and their bodies are well fed. They are not in trouble like others. They are not afflicted like most people. Therefore, pride is their necklace and violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge out from fatness. Ew. The imaginations of their hearts run wild. They mock and they speak maliciously. They arrogantly threaten oppression. They set their mouths against heaven. Their tongues strut across the earth. Therefore, his people turn to them and drink in their overflowing words. And the wicked say, how can God know? Does the Most High know everything? Look at them, the wicked. They're always at ease and they increase their wealth. Did I purify my heart and wash my hands in innocence for nothing? For I'm afflicted all day long and punished every morning. If I had decided to say these things aloud, I would have betrayed your people. And when I tried to understand all of this, it seemed hopeless. Like I said, he's a little mopey here. He's, he's in a bummer of a world. He says, I see the prosperity of the wicked and I envied them. So he knows the problem immediately is because he's struggling with this question of why do good things happen to bad people? We're not talking about comparing paper scores anymore. Like my, like my poor little Nathan from a couple years ago, right? Right. That poor little Nathan got the same grade as somebody on the paper. We're talking about the wicked who are doing wicked, vile things and they're getting away with it, right? They're getting away with it and their life is good and prosperous. He says, hold up. Shouldn't, shouldn't karma be kicking in somewhere? Lord, uh, the people who do bad things, shouldn't they get their comeuppets, right? Shouldn't you strike them dead immediately? What's happening? Why is it that good things are happening to these bad people? And he talks about several of them. Verse seven, their eyes bulge out from fatness. Right? I said, ooh, right? That's this idea that you're, you're so morbidly obese, right? That your eyes are just kind of squeaking out there. That's weird. Everyone say, ooh, ooh, right? Ooh. What that means back then though, is that they eat a lot, which means they can eat a lot, right? See, if, if you have a culture in which fatness can prevail, right? When, when you can have epidemics of obesity, like in our country, right? That means that there's a certain degree of wealth, all right? You have to remember that's always connected to wealth, especially in the ancient biblical era, right? And so what he's, what he's pointing out there is he's saying, look, some of these people are so wicked, they're so vile, and yet they have so much wealth that they can eat whatever they want as much as they want, right? They're eating buffets every day. What on earth? That's his point. He says, why is it that they are like, wealthy and literally full of themselves and yet wicked. That shouldn't be fair. Why aren't the righteous that well-fed? And then he says, the imaginations of their hearts run wild. They get everything they want. The word for imagination there is a carven statue, right? Like an idol. That's what that word means. He says, look, they make tons of idols and they get to worship all of them. What on earth? God, you've killed people for that stuff. Why? Are they not dead? Verse 10, he says, his people turn to them. They begin to drink from their overflowing words. What's his point there? He's saying, these people are wicked and they're doing so well that your people, God, are starting to turn and do what they do, right? They're looking at their lives going, well, that's better than mine. Clearly the right way is not working out. The right way is making my life hard. The wrong way is making them prevail. I want to do what they're doing. And so he goes and he lives, they're, they're all going and living like the rest of them. Worst of all, verse 11, they mock the very idea of God, right? Who is this God? Does he know anything? I don't know. They live comfortably while all of these things are out of order. Can you see why Asaph's upset? It's like, Lord, why aren't you dealing with this? This is, this is immensely wrong. They seem to have everything they want. What about the righteous? How are they living? He says, I wash my hands in innocence. Is it for nothing? Right? In other words, he's trying, right? Self-discipline, purity, all of that takes a lot of work. 
don't know if, if you're if you're following Christ and you're trying to to live by by the design that we see in Scripture that God has for your life, you figured out by now it's hard. It's a difficult thing. It's challenging to have self discipline. Everyone ever anyone like try to get up in the morning without their parents waking them up? How many of you wake up without your parents' help? <laughs> How many of you are like I would like to, but it's hard. You know what I mean? You ever struggle to get up in the morning? It takes some self-discipline, right? It takes some practice. It takes it takes some habit building. This is always a struggle for us. Self-discipline is hard. He says the righteous are doing their best. We're trying to live a self-disciplined, self-controlled life. What's the point? What's the point? It's still, it's not getting us anywhere. Is it worth all the hard work? He says he's afflicted all day long and punished every morning. He's living in inner turmoil. In other words, you ever do something bad and you feel guilty about it? right? I hope so. Gosh, right? I know you've done bad things, so I hope you felt guilty about it. He says, look, the wicked don't feel guilty, right? I do something wrong. It bothers me. I, I, I like lay awake all night. I'm like, gosh, darn it. That was a bad thing to do. Lord, I'm sorry. Hey, he's, he's saying, I feel guilty and the wicked are doing much worse things than I am. And yet they seem perfectly comfortable. They seem perfectly happy. So you can see all of this feels very backwards and he feels so frustrated. He's like, why bother to do what's right when it seems like doing wrong gets you so much further? Living this is so much more difficult having to see them live so comfortably. So a few years ago, my wife and I had this crazy idea. We said, hey, let's climb a mountain. You read that crazy idea? All right, at least one, at least one idea. So we, we didn't use climbing gear or anything. We weren't like scaling a mountain. We were just kind of going up a hiking trail. It was a place called Wheeler Peak. It's the highest point in New Mexico, right? We're on vacation. We said, let's go climb that mountain. It'll be awesome. So we did this big, long hike and we start that hike and we're like, this place is so pretty. We're just walking through the woods. And then we start going uphill a little bit and we're like, I'm kind of tired. So we, we, we bought, we literally bought like those camelbacks you put on, you know, a little tube of water. I don't know if I needed it, but I liked it. I was good. Walking, walking. So grade starts going up and I'm going, all right. So I'm still going. And then we get past the timber line. I don't know if you know what that means, but it means trees don't grow anymore as you're going up the side of a mountain. Eventually it's just rocks. That's what's left. No more trees, just rocks. So now we're going up, up and I'm going, I'm out of water, right? I'm like I'm running out. I'm like, this isn't good. Now we're in rocks. And then you hit switchbacks is where instead of going up the mountain, you're now going, and all of that are rocks. I remember literally standing on the path. Where you could clearly see in the grass, the path. And there was just rocks in front of us. And we were like, where'd the path go? It, it literally leads into, the, we had to go on the rocks. We work our way. And all of a sudden, this becomes to be really tiring. All right. Not only am I tired, my wife was tired, which made it worse for me. Because now I've got a wife who's like, L, L, L. Now, every step, she was starting to get blisters. This was a problem. So we begin to reach this question in our minds. Can you hear it? Is this a good idea? Is this worth it? There's a light, pretty lake at the bottom. That was a nice enough view. Why are we doing this? Right? Certain point, you get to a, something that's so hard, you start to feel like ASAP feels. And you just go, is it worth it? Is it worth it to keep going? In verse 17, we're going to pick it up there. He has this drastic change in attitude. I want you to hear it, right? He had just said, when I tried to understand all of these problems, it seemed hopeless. Next verse, until I entered God's sanctuary, then I understood their destiny. Indeed, you put them in slippery places. You make them fall into ruin. How suddenly they become a desolation. They come to an end, swept away by terrors, like one waking from a dream, Lord, when arising, you will despise their image. He says, wait a second. They're all going to die, right? Such is life. Everyone comes to an end. He says, all of a sudden, I get it now. He realizes what the most important difference. Why is it okay for all of this to be good? Why is it okay for them to prosper while I don't get to prosper, but I'm living the righteous life. They're living the wicked life. Wait, when it's all over, where do they end up? Where do I end up, right? His perspective shifts from the here and now to the future. He begins to think about that word destiny. He says destiny. In other words, the end. That's what he's thinking about, the end. At the end, they're all punished for their wickedness. See, God doesn't always fix things in the here and now. 
but he has assured us that they will be fixed in the end. All those who do wickedness will be justly repaid for it. So he knows they're, they're coming to this destruction. Why does he have this shift in attitude though? This is a pretty sudden shift. I don't usually come from bouts of deep depression like that and I just skyrocket into, oh, everything's fine, right? Something has to happen to get me there. What happens? He says, I entered God's sanctuary. Sanctuary is the place where they worship God. That was a place where God was present in a unique and special way. So they, he goes into this place to worship his God. Right? Something that's probably just a habit of his, regular old habit. You can imagine yourself waking up one morning, kind of mopey, kind of tired, not really wanting to go to church. And then you walk into church and things shifted all of a sudden. His attitude lifts up. He goes, wait, I'm in the presence of God. And now things make more sense to me. When we seek God's presence, our focus will shift from our circumstances to our eternity. Right? We stop looking at the here and now. We stop asking questions about how fair it is right now. We stop saying things like, life is unfair for me right now. And we start saying things like, whoa, look what we have to look forward to, right? Because we're dealing with an eternal God, are we not? We all agree God lives forever, never dies. He doesn't, right? There was one time he died for like two days. It was like, nope, had a plan, right? Resurrected, our God lives forever. This is the God we worship. So he's like, there's a whole eternity. You're complaining about these minute things, but there's a whole eternity. There's lots of reasons why people climb mountains. We did make it to the top of Wheeler Peak and we get to the top of Wheeler Peak and there's, there's some people who are just sitting there looking out at the view of the mountain. There's lots of people up there as it turns out. I guess everyone had this crazy idea. So lots of people up there. Some of them are just looking at the view. My wife and my brother who both hiked with me, they, they pulled out their cameras when they got there. They were hiking with cameras. So they get to the top and they're like, <laughs> they just, all of the things, right? They get all of the shots and I'm just like looking at the view and, like, don't you want to take any pictures with your phone? I'm like, no, my wife's over there with a really expensive camera. I'll look at those photos later. And she's going to do a better job than I. So some people are taking photos. Some people are looking. Here's what I was excited about. At the top of that mountain, there's a notebook. All right. There's just a notebook sitting on a rock. And if you open that notebook, it's the names of everybody and the date that they climbed this mountain. I was like, bet. Signing my name, right? That way anyone who comes to that mountain after me sees my name and knows I got there before them, all right? That's where it's, it's my brain works. So there's lots of reasons why that trip might be made worth it, right? In order to get past the struggle of life, though, we need to kind of see that. We need to be able to go, wait, in eternity, it's going to be fine. We need to see past our current struggles. For Christians, for believers in God, that's as simple as just looking to eternity to remember that our lifespan is like right here and eternity just goes on forever. And God promises that we get to be in that with him forever. In eternity, we, you know, scripture talks about, especially a lot in the New Testament, about our names being written in the book of life. Just like I wrote my name down in that notebook right on the top of the mountain. In scripture, it literally talks about our names as believers in God being written down in what's called the book of life. And once our names are written there, they can't be erased, right? And so we're, that, that's something that goes for eternity, right? My point is it goes past the circumstances of now. It goes past this destiny, this end. So we see some things just might be worth it. Let's finish out the, the chapter here, the Psalm, and then we'll dig in some more. Verse 21 says this, when I became embittered, my innermost being was wounded I was stupid and didn't understand. I was an unthinking animal towards you. And yet I'm always with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel and afterward you will take me up in glory. Who do I have in heaven but you? And I desire nothing on earth but you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. Those far from you will certainly perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, God's presence is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge so I can tell about all you do. And then he did exactly that. By the way, he wrote it all down and presented it as a song that they could worship. 
want you to note a couple of things here. First, in verse 22, Asaph points out he was wounded. He was hurting. Anything ever struck you that deep where you're just like, man, there was a day there where I was just wounded. That hurt. You know, we like to, sometimes we say that phrase, hurt my feelings, right? And that those words put together now, we, we go, it's like kiddish language, right? We talk about kids having their feelings hurt. But in reality, we all feel that to some degree. You ever felt that where you're just like, that, that did hurt. Like that hurt me inwardly, right? Yeah, of course we felt this. He said, when I was wounded, I did what? He said, when I was wounded, I was stupid. Not, not I had no right to be wounded, but I was wounded. And so I wasn't thinking clearly. I was an unthinking animal, he says. I was going on nothing but instincts. He says, look, when I was hurt, Lord, I, I just didn't understand. I just didn't get it. That's the truth, right? When we're hurt, it's often when we're hurting that we don't think clearly, all right? We rarely think clearly when we're hurting. So you have to give people some credit sometimes when they're hurting and they say something foolish, you just go, yeah, they're not using their entire brain right now. Half their brain's going, ow, 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 right? So it's hard. When we're hurting, sometimes we don't think clearly. But despite his feelings of pain and his stupid thinking, he says, and yet I am always with you. Remember we talked about a minute ago. He said, when I entered God's sanctuary and God's presence, then I remembered. Then he says, here he goes, wait, yet I am always with you. Your right hand guides me. Your right hand is with me. You're my portion, my strength. You're the one guiding me. You've always been here, Lord. You've always been here. Even when I was hurting, even when I was being dumb, you were there. The truth is that when God enters our life, he doesn't leave it. He never does. Our God is worth it. It's worth making it to the top of that mountain. It's worth getting through life's circumstances. Why? Because we have a God who's going with us. We're not feeling these things that say, hey, nothing seems fair. Everything seems backward. Why is God picking on me? God's not picking on you. He's walking right next to you. And he knows exactly what you're feeling. He knows the pain. He knows the confusion. He knows the, the feelings of unfairness. But he says, it's okay. One day, I'm going to make everything right. I just need you to trust me and walk with me. That's what our God does. See, I've had friendships come and go, right? A lot of times friendships can be bound by a time period or a season in your life where you're in the same thing as somebody. And it, it's okay. Sometimes it's just bound by location. You have friends move away and they become, they're still friends in your mind, right? If you see them again, you're gonna be cordial with them, especially if you've developed a good friendship. And you can do things sometimes to make sure that certain friendships last. But there are friendships that just come and go. There's people in your life that come and go, right? That can be painful sometimes. You ever had somebody leave your life and you're like, that hurt? I didn't like that. Yeah, I get it. It hurts. People come and go. Our God doesn't. Our God never enters our life and then walks out the back door, right? He never comes in and says, I'm here for this season of your life, but I'm going to get gone when you get to be this old or when you get a new job, I'll, I'll, I'll leave. No, our God's a permanent resident and our heart's permanent. He sticks around. He says to him, he'll take me up in glory, verse 24. And when does he do that? He says, he'll take me up in glory afterward. That's the same word, the same word used in the, the Hebrew root word right there is the same exact word as earlier when he talked about the wicked's destiny. Remember we said in the end, things will be different, but in the end, we're taken up in glory. In the end, we're just with God forever. We're with him for eternity. We're taken out of this crazy situation, out of the discomfort, out of our bad circumstances, out of the unfairness. We're taken to be with him. That's the promise of God. That's God's presence to walk with us. He can change our very destinies. My question is, do you believe that tonight? Have you struggled to believe that? At some point in your life, you probably will if you haven't already. You've probably been faced with that question. Is God good? Is God fair? Because it sure doesn't look like it right now. But we're thinking that things need to be exactly perfectly fair right now. And he says, I'm going to make things fair, but I'm giving you time, right? I want you to work on each other for a while. And I want you guys to have a chance to choose to trust me and choose to walk with me. But there will be a day when all of those, all of that opportunity, all of that time to choose the Lord and walk with him and to choose which path you're going to be on the straight and narrow or doing whatever you want, all of that will come to an end right? We'll reach our destiny and we're either with God or we're not. 
If you've made that decision to follow Christ, to believe that he did die on a cross and rise again for you, you believe that, you've professed that, then you have that relationship with him and nothing can take that away. God's not going to enter your life and walk out of it, I promise. There are gonna be days where you don't feel like he's there. Promise he is, promise he is. He doesn't leave your life once he enters it. But some of you may not have let him enter your life. That's my question for all of you tonight. I want you to evaluate yourself. Have you let God into your life? Do you have that relationship with him? And if you're not sure, when Corey sings this last song, you just slip out of your chair, come talk to me about it. Because I want you to be sure. I want you to know that in, in the end, in the afterwards, when we get to your destiny, that you're gonna be with God. Moreover, I want you to enjoy his presence now. Because there's a peace, there's a comfort. When you've got God's presence, you know you're taken care of. Even when all else looks backwards and wrong, you can know that this God loves me and cares for me. You get a chance tonight to make that decision if you haven't. And if you have, just take heart, be encouraged. I promise you, God's with you. I haven't always felt that he's with me, right? There's been times where my feet have nearly slipped, but the truth is God is good. And that doesn't have to have a question mark at the end of it. Why don't you stand with me? Let me pray for us. And you respond as you need to during this last song. Father God, thank you so much for your word. Or we thank you that you can hear us, Lord, when we just spend time crying out about all the unfairness. Lord, Asaph reached out to you and he just told you all of this stuff from his heart, Lord. And you just encouraged him. You just heard it all. And then you were present with him and you showed him, Lord, eternity. You showed him how he can trust you. And Lord, I pray that for our students tonight, that there wouldn't be a single person in this room, Lord, that doesn't have that assurance that they can trust you in your presence. If there's any of them, Lord, who haven't chosen to walk in that presence, who haven't chosen to have a relationship with you, Lord, help them tonight to be courageous enough to start that relationship with you. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.